We still got the Word of God. First Timothy chapter 2, we are in week 4 of our series. First Timothy chapter 2, very excited about the passage for today. Going to challenge you at the end to be praying um, in some very specific ways, and so I hope that you'll listen from that perspective. As uh, Stephen was just sharing, I am excited about Easter and about this weekend, and uh, that this will be the first time in three years, I actually hope, well, I'm, I'm afraid to even say it. Like, I, I'm planning to be with you next Sunday, Lord willing, if nothing, if nothing occurs. That two years ago, we were all at home last year, home with COVID. This year, I'm hoping to be here and to be with you. And, and so, very excited about Easter, very excited about the opportunity to worship alongside of you. One of the things about Easter, though, is that it, does, is it gives me pause to think about and to celebrate and be reflective on um, of what Christ has done for me, about how he has saved me, his, his work in my own heart and life, but it also stirs within me a desire to, to want to share with others. And it reminds me, and it should remind us as a body of believers again, that this gospel, this good news was not entrusted to us just to hold on to for ourselves, but that we are encouraged, we are challenged to, to share this good news out with the world around us, to share with people from all different walks of life the hope of Jesus Christ. And so the question becomes, how do we do that? And what's the most meaningful way from a human perspective, in terms of the human factor, we know there's, God is the one who ultimately is the author of and the source of salvation, but in terms of how we join him in that work, what's the most important thing that we could do? As we as a body of believers, as we embrace this identity as a people who help people find and follow Jesus, then what does that, what does that mean for us? What does that look like? What, what's, the, what's the most critical thing that we can do as a body of believers to help reach lost people? And some might say, well, having some, uh, some uh, Bible presentation or some gospel presentation memorized is most important. You need an outline memorized. You need to be able to be ready to have a conversation at the drop of a hat that in any opportunity that God would give, you need to be ready to do that. Others might say, well, if you got a gospel presentation, at the end of the day, if your life doesn't back it up, it's of no use. And so they might talk about the importance of integrity, of living life in a certain way, of relational evangelism, of, of living so that others could see Christ in you to earn the right to be able to share the gospel with them. Uh, others might say it's important to have a, a service and have things going on in the church where, where lost people are comfortable coming, where we can invite them to and know that if they come with us, they're going to hear the gospel, they're going to be confronted with truth, they're going to, to be loved, and they're going to be welcomed, and they're going to be shared uh, with, and so maybe that's an important part. Others may say lost people are never going to come here, so we've got to have a strategy for how we're going to get out there, how we're going to take this gospel to the world around us, to our workplace and school and communities and so forth. And I would say yes, that all of those are important. But if you were to ask me what is the single most important thing that we can do as people of God, helping people find and follow Jesus based on God's word, specifically based on the passage we're going to look at today, I believe that we would say it's prayer. Now, to give us some context, and I want to look at the passage today, the, 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 the city of Ephesus was a place where Paul had ministered to for, a, for at least three years. He had poured into and sort of from that base had ministered out to other areas for, for a three-year period. And when he left, he told them, when I leave, there's going to be a, a threat of false teachers and false teachings that might come in to gain attention for themselves. And that's exactly what happened. And Paul discovers that these uh, people have, are teaching a, a different doctrine, an essentially different doctrine, that, that what's happening in Ephesus, and again, remember the church there is not just a singular building sort of in the middle of the city. It is a gathering of God's people in homes all around the city, and there might have been hundreds of those. But in those gatherings, there began to be some false teaching, some false doctrine that in some way highlighted um, unique aspects of the Old Testament to, who dove into genealogies and things and made up myths and legends. They're, they seemed to be sort of a works-based righteousness, a, a focus on a certain group of people that God was really interested in, but maybe largely not interested in others. And so Paul says, Timothy, I will need you to go there and straighten this out. I need you, in fact, the, in large part, the first chapter is all about Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy, I'm, I'm giving you this call. You've been, er, you've been called by God, and I've sent you now to go and command these false teachers to stop. It, it's so important. It is so critical. False teaching is such a threat to the life and the vitality of the church and of, of God's people and of, of people who don't yet know God, who might get swept away by it and never come to faith in Christ. It's so critical, Timothy, that you must silence, you must stop these false teachers. And then, though, he's going, he moves on, and in chapter 2, he begins to give instruction to 
Timothy and through Timothy to the church at Ephesus about how they are to carry themselves, what they are to do as the gathered body of believers, and especially in chapter 2 of, of what to do as they gather for public worship. That, that when they come together as the people of God and to worship God together, what are those things, how are they to carry themselves? How are they to behave themselves? And he gives some, some pretty specific instruction to men and to women that we'll look at today and we'll look at in uh, a couple of weeks after Easter. But at the very top of that list, he could have started with any number of things. He could have started with, with church leadership and qualifications. He should, could have started with church administrative type, type things. But instead, he starts with the importance of prayer. He puts right up at the top of the list of priorities, God's people pray. He says that God's people are to be a praying people. And specifically, that we are to be a people who pray for those who do not yet know Christ. And what we're going to see is this, and we're going to read the whole passage, and then we'll sort of break it down together. But, but here's sort of the big idea that I believe God would want to uh, reveal to us this morning. It's this, that God's people are to pray for all people because God desires all to be rightly related to him. God's people, that's us, God's people are to pray for all people because God desires that all would be rightly related to him. Now keep that in mind and look at the passage with me. In your Bible, on your phone, however you're following along, 1 Timothy chapter 2, begin at verse 1. First of all, then, Paul writes, I urge that entreaties and prayers. Now, this is after, again, he's given this command, this call. This, he's been very clear. Timothy, you've got to confront these false teachers. But now he's moving into a different section of the letter about how they carry themselves, how they handle themselves when they gather as the people of God. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men... For kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For, for this, Paul says, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm, not tell, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without dissension. And what we're going to see is that Paul is going to give us this command to pray, but then also provides us with both the focus and the basis for those prayers. As we acknowledge, again, this, this truth that God's people are to pray for all people because God desires that all would be rightly related to him. Let's pray together and then let's look together this morning. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that there is good news to declare. Thank you that at this season of the years we are mindful on this on this Palm Sunday of Christ's triumphal entry into the city, Jesus marching toward his death, knowing what is before him, knowing the pain, knowing the agony of the cross, but also knowing the ultimate victory of the resurrection, was willing to embrace those realities so that we, through Christ, God, might know you. You were willing to go to this extent that we might have the opportunity to know you, to be rightly related to you. People, lost people, God, matter to your heart, and it is clear that you desire they would matter to ours. And not just that we think about them, not just that we have them on our minds or in our hearts, but that they would be in our prayers, and not just individually, but as the people of God. And so this morning, Spirit of God, open our eyes to see what you're saying through your word to us as your people, not just in some generic way, but as the people of Woodland Park and as the people sitting here in this room, in this moment, God, for my heart and for each heart in this place, Spirit of God, take the truth of your word and apply it to our lives and help us see what you would have us to do in response as your people. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, there's a command, there's the focus and the basis of this prayer. Notice, first of all, the command. And again, in verses 1 and 2, he says, First of all, then, I urge, I command, in essence, that entreaties and prayers, petitions, thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, all men including kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. 
That, that phrase, first of all, of course, could mean first in a, a sort of a list of things. I've got a number of things I'm going to address. Here's the first thing I want to talk about. But most believe it's first in terms of, of, of importance, first in priority. Not just first in sequence, but first in importance. That among the most important aspects of the gathered body of Christ and what that might look like is that God's people are to be a people who pray. And by prayer, again, we simply are talking about us talking to God, us communicating to God our hearts to His. It's not some fancy language. It's not speaking in King James English. It's not memorizing or simply quoting from some book of prayers. It is simply us communicating our heart to God and sharing our hearts with Him. And why is that so important? It's important because it's a reminder to us of our complete dependence upon God. That if there's anything good to come out of my life, if there's anything good to come out of your life, if there's anything of eternal value to come out of Woodland Park, it'll be because God does it in and through us as his people. And apart from him, the Bible says, we can do nothing. And so in prayer, we are reminded of our dependence upon God. In prayer, we are connecting our heart to the heart of God and his will, his desire for his people, for his church. In prayer, we we are aligning our hearts with God's heart. And because prayer is so important to the people of God, Paul says that he urges, that word is he admonishes with a sense of urgency. It's sort of a a polite way of saying this is what you should do. This This is command. This is the will, the desire of God for his people that they would engage in all forms of prayer. And he mentions different kinds. He talks about entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings. And those first three are really just synonyms. They're they're words used in similar ways throughout the New Testament, but they have a certain nuance to them. For example, Entreaties is the idea of presenting a specific need to God, acknowledging that he is the source. He is the one who's able to meet that need, so we bring that, again, that specific need before him. The word prayers is the most general of terms of of calling out to God in some way. The word petitions there is a more informal conversation. It's the idea of the boldness with which we can all throughout our day and through whatever's going on in our life, we can talk to God, communicate with God, share our hearts with God. And then, of course, thanksgiving, gratitude, appreciation. So so if you put those together, Paul's basically saying that God's people, the church, is to employ every dimension of prayer, formal and informal, petitions and thanksgiving. And he says we're to do so, notice, on behalf of all men. Now, again, as I understand it, based on reading, the, the, most scholars believe, if you sort of put together all the pieces of the puzzle from Timothy and other sources, that these, th- these false teachers in Ephesus at this time were teaching this sort of elitism that God is con- concerned about a certain group of people, a certain kind of person that God saves from among a certain group of people. But, and so you're to pray for those, but largely God doesn't care about these other people in these other circles, these other kinds of people, so just ignore them. Focus your prayers on this certain group and on these kinds of people and and just ignore these others because God isn't nearly as concerned about them. But Paul is reminding through Timothy to the church that we are to have a heart for, we are to be praying on behalf of all men. In other words, listen, there is not one person on this crowded planet we call earth in whom God does not have a personal interest. You never lock eyes with, you never interact with a single individual. There's not one person on this planet that does not in some way matter to the heart of God. Every person, your neighbor, your boss, your coworker, your fellow students, challenging people, hurtful people, mean-spirited people, people who wound you, people who wronged you, people who believe different than you, people who speak different than you, people who look different than you, people who act different than you, all matter to the heart of God. And so God, through Paul, said, I want you to expand your focus. I want you to to increase your vision. I want you to be ready to pray for anyone, anytime, and anywhere. So when he says all men there, I want you to think about it. I I don't think he's just saying like, all people, like every single individual, but I think he's primarily speaking of, of every kind of person, men from, from every walk of life. God cares about human beings regardless of their nationality or their race or their social position, he, he, and, and so should we. If that matters to God, it should matter to, to us. And not only should we care about such people, but we are to pray for them. And so he opens this section on important matters related to the gathered church Focusing on prayer and specifically praying for people from all different walks of life, including, notice, including verse 2, 
sort of a subset he describes for kings and for all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Do you know who was the king or the leader at the time that Paul is writing? Nero. Nero's name was synonymous with terror and tyranny. It was at, under the hands and under the leadership of Nero that thousands of Christians were, were put to death in brutal and horrific ways. And yet Paul says, here's a man as wretched and as wicked and as vile as he and others alongside of him may be. He matters to the heart of God and therefore he should matter to your heart and you should pray for him. In fact, he says, you have a vested interest in doing so for them so that, that's a purpose statement, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in godliness and dignity. We should pray for our leaders, not only for their heart, not only for, for their relationship with God, but we pray knowing that if a leader, even if they aren't a believer, if they lead in such a way that they allow us as believers to carry out our lives and to do what God has called and invited us to do in quietness and, and in calmness, then, then it becomes a, a place where the gospel goes forth, where we can gather publicly for worship, where we gather without fear of governing authorities. We have a vested interest in praying for our leaders even if we don't agree with them. And so he says, pray for them and do so, notice, and so that we can live a life in godliness and dignity, living in a right relationship toward God, living with a, a respect towards those around us. And so if the early, now, now listen, don't miss this. If the early church was to pray for Nero, understanding that his heart, his life mattered to the heart of God, then there should be no limit whatsoever to those that we would pray for as believers. And so when was the last time, I don't, regardless of political party, when was the last time you prayed for our president or prayed for your governor or prayed for other governing officials? When was the last time you prayed that Vladimir Putin for, when's the last time, listen, regardless of their lifestyle, regardless of their mindset, and not praying God kill them, but God saved them. God transformed them. God do something powerful in their heart and in their life because they matter. That's a person created in your image, in your likeness, for your glory, made God to know you, and so God transformed. When was the last time we prayed in that way? Look down at verse 8, sort of bookending this passage there's a command to pray, and then there's another one, verse 8. Therefore, he sort of, and we'll see in the in-between, he tells us why we should pray and toward what end we're to pray, and we'll look at that in a moment. But he says here, therefore, I want the men. Now, he's going to give instruction to women, begin at verse 9, that we'll look at in two weeks, and hopefully you guys will not kill me in that. But we're just going to look at what the Word of God says and how we apply it. But verse 8, therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Paul says, again, it's, it's natural that he would challenge the men to do so. Men were largely the, the spiritual leaders in the life of the church, uh, similar to how they led in Jewish synagogues and in other spiritual gatherings. But he says in some way, it, God desires that the men would lead in this sort of prayer. Now, I don't know about what your experience has been, but mine has been, I'm, I've been uh, so you see, I'm 49, and I've been in church my whole life and was going even before I was born in my mom's belly. So, but my experience in, in the church I grew up in and the churches I've pastored is that when there is a prayer gathering, it is almost always uh, much more crowded with. The majority are almost always women, always. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if there's a, a, a I, don't, I really don't know. I'm sure there's, there's some reason, there's some psychology, there's something behind that. There's something spiritual behind that. But in most cases, it is the women who lead out in prayer. And so it's, it's encouraging. It's a challenge, I think, to the men in this room and to the men who would consider ourselves, the, who are seeking to lead our families well and seeking to, 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 to be a part of leading our church well, that he says, men, I want you to lead the way in this. Imagine what God will do in the life of a body of believers where the men have a heart for prayer and specifically a heart of prayer for people who are far from God from every walk of life to come to know Jesus. That's a place that God will set on fire for his glory. 
But I think more specifically than, than the focus on who's doing the praying is how that prayer is done. And, and it's not about the lifting of holy hands. That was how they did it. They would lift their hands, palms open. This was a way of sort of, I'm presenting my needs to God and I'm receiving from God. But more importantly than the hands being lifted is, is his description of the hands. He says that we are to pray with, with holy hands. That we are to come before the Lord with lives that are set apart. Our prayers are to be backed up by a life that is lived set apart from sin, set apart to God. Including, he says, they're praying without wrath, that is on good terms with each other and without dissension, not disputing or contentious. The kind of prayers that, that gather up strength and power and impact the heart of God and that move a body of believers forward is... It's when despite the many things that we may have as differences among us, we're able to set those things aside. And because of a common love for Jesus and a common desire to get this gospel to our neighbors and to the nations, we gather and we pour our hearts out to God in prayer for his glory and for the redemption of men and women from every walk of life. Paul could have started again. He could have started this section as he begins to talk about gathering when the church is gathered. How they, he could have started this talking about leadership and qualifications. He could have started talking about widows and administration. He could have started talking about financial things. But no, he begins with prayer for all people as being of utmost importance for God's people when we gather together. We are to be a praying people who share God's heart and compassion and vision for all people no matter who they are. There's a command here. But then notice, secondly, the focus of our prayers. So, okay, it's one thing to say, I want you to pray for all people, for people from every walk of life. But, okay, what are we to pray for them? What's the focus of our prayers? I think he gives us instruction there in verses 3 and 4. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men, notice, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He says, praying this way, praying for people from, as we gather together as the people of God, whether in a small group, in a worship setting, when God's people gather, when we set aside time to pray for people from every walk of life, this is good. It is morally beautiful. It is excellent. It is, it is pleasing to God. He, he, God re gladly receives those kinds of prayers. But he says those prayers are pleasing to God because they are consistent with his nature. What is his nature? Verse 3, he is our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Listen, God wants us to pray for all kinds of people because God desires to save all kinds of people. He is our Savior. That, he is the source of our salvation. He is the, the, he is the one who enables people to be transformed. And, and it's his desire that men and women from every walk of life would know him as Savior and Lord. God wants to save Jews and Gentiles. God wants to save common people and civic authorities. God wants to reach rich and poor, religious and pagan. Your neighbor, your crazy uncle, your difficult boss, your coworker, your classmate, that person at the checkout line, that person that will wait on you at the restaurant, that person who brings your laundry out to you when you go to the, the cleaners, whatever it may be. Again, you never lock eyes with a single individual who doesn't matter to the heart of God. And foremost in our concern for them and foremost in our prayer for them is that they would know God, that they would be saved. It says this is the desire of God. That word, the, the, the verb their desires is the, is the primary verb for these two verses. That, this is the very heart of it, that God has a heart that all people would be saved. He desires to save all men. Now we know, we know that not all will be saved. We know because based on God's word, based on experience, that not all will trust in Christ. But it's not up to us to decide who does and who doesn't. It's not up to me to decide that I want these people to be saved, but I'm going to care less about those. It's not up to me, and it wasn't up to the, the false teachers of Paul's day to say, hey, we should pray for this certain group of people because they really matter to God, but God doesn't care a thing about No, God cares about them all. They all matter to the heart of God, and therefore they should all matter to me. God has extended an invitation that whosoever will may come. And there's not, again, there's not one person on this crowded planet in whom God does not have a personal interest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes, whoever believes in him should not perish but could have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world, John 3, 17, 
to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God desires for people from every walk of life to know him, but only those who notice, who come to the knowledge of truth, are saved. Jesus died and has extended the invitation that whoever would desire could come, but only those who would come to this knowledge of the truth are saved, those who would know, who would believe that we were created for God's glory. We were made for relationship with God, but that sin has entered into the world and has separated us from God. But Christ came to pay the price for that sin so that through faith in him, through forgiveness that he alone can bring, that we can be brought back into relationship with God and we can spend forever with God. If I will believe and entrust my life on those truths, repenting of my sin, turning in surrender to Jesus, then I can be saved and I can experience his saving power in my life. Praying for all people pleases God because it's God's desire to save all kinds of people. And listen, that should be our desire, our heart. And the focus of our prayer should be that they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They're spiritually dead. And there's not, nothing you and I can do to restore death to life. God alone is a supernatural work of transformation. And therefore, we must. It makes sense that we would call out to God for his work in the lives of the lost. Because apart from him, we can do nothing apart from him. There is no hope for those who do not know Jesus. So more than praying for their health or their success or blessings in other ways, all those things are valuable. All those things are, we, are see, we see exemplified in God's word. And to pray for these for our children, to pray for these for our loved ones, to pray for these for our friends. But the primary focus, the primary focus and desire of our heart should be to see people from every walk of life surrender to Jesus. Paul in Romans 10.1 says of the Jewish people who believed in God but who did not believe in Jesus. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. The ongoing heartbeat of Paul was a desire to see the Jewish people come to faith in Christ. And this is something we're to pray for. Notice Again, the, the context here is when the gathered body, this is something we're to do together. Again, most uh, prayer gatherings that I am in in church over the years, largely, you know, sometimes it sounds like an organ recital. You've heard this, you know, we're praying for this person's lungs and this person's heart and this person's stomach and this person's brain and this person's this. So we sort of, we go through all the physical needs or we pray for wisdom as somebody's making a decision or we pray for this person because they're having a hard time and that things will get better for them. And again, all those things are appropriate. When was the last time that you and a gathering of other believers exclusively and with clarity and with passion prayed for lost people to be saved. If you're a small group leader, when was the last time that your group together put out together alongside one name names and said, these are on my heart and I'm heartbroken. Would you pray with me and, 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 and for their transformation, not just for their health and not just for their happiness and not just for God's way, but would you join me in praying for their souls that they would be saved? When we're talking together as pastors, like how do we do more of that as a body of believers? And, and we're going to wrestle through that over the, the weeks ahead and what that might look like. But also as individuals, we need to be wrestling with how can I, how can I do this as, as a more part of a disciplined part of my life? And I'll give you some ideas in just a moment. But, but let me look firstly, though, or at least thirdly, maybe I should say, we've talked about the command. We've talked about the focus. Now, now what's the basis? What are the convictions? What's the theological truth that would give us encouragement to pray in this way for people from every walk of life, for their salvation in Christ? They would come to the saving knowledge of him. I think he tells us in verses 5 through 7, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time, at just the right time that he came and he did. For this, Paul says, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And adds in there, I'm telling the truth. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not lying. So what, what's, the, what's the basis? Well, think, first of all, he says, there is one God. Now, if you know anything about Ephesus, you might know or 
you might know that it was the site of one of the seven wonders of the world, this grand temple to the goddess um, Artemis, or the Romans knew her as Diana. And it was a, a place where, um, where they would gather for the goddess of the hunt, but also a goddess of, um, of fertility. And so there were all sorts of horrific things that were done there, supposedly in the name of worshiping these gods. But oftentimes in that culture, different cities had their own gods, and there was a multitude of gods they would pray to and that they would seek to sacrifice to and they would seek favor from. But what Paul is saying and what he would remind us of, listen, there's not a God for Chattanooga that's different from the God of Atlanta, different from the God of New York, different from the God of, of L.A., different from the God of England or, 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 or London. Or There's not a, a God over America and a different God over Africa. No, there's one. There is one God who's over it all, who's the creator of it all, who's the sustainer of it all, who has created no matter who we are, no matter where we live, no matter how we speak, no matter what we look like, that we were made. All of humanity was created by God for his glory and made for relationship with him. There's one God, but then there's also, notice, there's one mediator. That word is a, a negotiator who helps two parties come to, to some kind of transaction. There, there is one God, but there is only, also only one mediator, one negotiator who could bring these two parties together. That God in his holiness and his perfection is separated from man and our sinfulness and our wickedness. And there's no amount of good works. There's no amount of good deeds. There's no amount of church attendance. There's no amount of, of Bible memorization. There's no amount of good behavior that can get me from where I am to where he is. I can't bridge that gap. Somebody had to. And who is that mediator? He is, notice verse 5, he is the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself voluntarily. His life wasn't taken. He gave himself as a ransom for all. Jesus, the one who is fully man, therefore he is one of us, represent us. Also fully God, therefore sinless, perfect, holy in every way, completely capable of and faithful to live up to the standard of God as no one else could. Jesus is fully God, fully man, the perfect one. One of us went to the cross and paid the ransom. He paid, that's the, that's the idea of a price that was paid to free a slave or to free a prisoner of war. Jesus went to the cross to pay the price to free us from enslavement to sin, to free us from the, 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 um, the, the power of the enemy, to free us to a life that would bring honor and glory to God. He paid the price. And he extended the invitation so that all, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you're from, no matter what you look like, no matter what you think, no matter what you believe, no matter what your dialect, no matter what country you're in, no matter what city you're from, no matter who you are, if you will place your faith in this mediator, Christ Jesus, God will save you from your sins. People in Tyner... And Saudi Daisy and Udawa and Cleveland and Ringgold and downtown Chattanooga. People of every race and every socioeconomic background. People who, no matter how they would identify themselves and their sexuality, whether you're the most pagan or whether you're the most religious, people from every, Jesus came that people from every background, from every lifestyle, from every nation, from every place, that people from every walk of life could turn from their sin and turn and surrender to Jesus and God would accept them in Christ. His sacrifice is sufficient to cover all sins, but is applied only to those who respond in faith. And so then the people of God, we are to regularly pray together for people from every walk of life to come to faith in Jesus, knowing that the price has been paid and the offer is extended to all. And it is that good news that drove Paul. That's why he says in verse 7 again, For this, for this gospel, for this truth, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher to the Gentiles. This reality of one God who is to be worshipped by all, of one mediator who alone can bring us into right relationship with God, the offer of salvation extended to people from every walk of life. These together lead God's people to pray for the salvation of all men and women from every walk of life and then to go, as Paul did, and share that good news with a lost and a hurting world. 
And as we do, we have the confidence that not only has Christ mediated this relationship between us and God to bring us into that relationship, but now he mediates our prayers. That he is our high priest. He is our go-between. He is the one that gives us access to God the Father. The confidence that I have as I pray is not in Brian's strength or Brian's goodness or Brian's religiosity or Brian's faith. The confidence I have is that I can come to God because I'm coming through his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, God welcomes me to bring those prayers to him. Praise God for our mediator. Paul gave his life to take this message of the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles alike. He prayed and he went. We must pray and we must preach the gospel because this is God. You may say, well, isn't there some other way? No, this is God's ordained method for reaching the lost world. We are to pray and we are to share. And God, through his people, is drawing people to himself. This is why, friends, listen. This is why when we say we are to be a people helping people find and follow Jesus, this is the why behind it. Because God's people are to pray for all people because God desires all to be rightly related to him. All people matter to God. And God invites them to himself. One of my spiritual heroes, if you ever want to read a um, a stirring and a powerful biography, pick up one about a man named George Mueller. Mueller was a believer in the 1800s in Bristol, England, who was known as a man of prayer, who, who opened some uh, five orphanages in the city, provided care for 10,000 orphans over a 60-year period, and never once asked anyone for a single dollar. Whenever there was a need, he prayed. Whenever he wasn't sure how to feed the kids, he prayed. Whenever there was a need in his own life, he prayed, and God, his, his journals are recorded in minute detail, thousands of answered prayer, directly answered to very specific prayers to God for his provision in various ways. Well, toward the end of his life, he commented in some setting that he had been praying for two specific men to be saved for 55 years. And someone asked him and said, don't you, don't you ever get tired of that? Like, don't you feel like giving up on these two men praying for all this time? Here's his response. Oh, no. Why would God give me such a burden for these men if he didn't intend to save them? And before his death, one of those men got saved. And after his death, that other man got saved. Fifty-five years of prayer answered in this powerful way. Friends, I would say his point is well taken that because God is God and because a true prayer burden that comes to our heart comes from God and doesn't come from us, we can well believe that if God would burden us to pray for a certain person or a certain group of people, it's because he intends to do a work of miraculous saving grace among them. Oh, that God would burden our hearts to pray. Unless you need one more reason why you would pray in this way. Listen, friends, at least in part, if you're a believer today, it's because somebody prayed for you. Somebody prayed for a softening of your heart. Somebody prayed that your blind eyes would be open. Somebody prayed that your pride would be torn down. Somebody pray that you would be brought to the end of yourself and that you would see Jesus for who he is and trust your heart to him. And God answered that prayer if you're a believer. How do we live this out? What are some practical recommendations? Let me, let me move towards closing by giving you five things real quick. Number one, pray that God would burden your heart for those far from him. Ask God, God, if, if this is on your heart, then I want to... If I love you and if I, my heart is in tune with yours, then it'll be on my heart too. So would you give me a heart for lost people? Both those who are close to me and those who I see as enemies and maybe who treat me as an enemy. God, give me a heart for those who are far from you, no matter who they are, no matter where they live, no matter what they look like. Pray for that burden. Number two, I'd encourage you to consider making a list of lost people and beginning to pray for them. Ask God to put on your heart specific names of people or maybe a people group in our world that doesn't have the gospel or a specific missionary who's working in a certain setting and whatever that, put it down in writing and find some disciplined way on a regular basis to pray for those individuals for God's work in their hearts and in their lives. Number three, 
As you do that, pray with others for the lost. This is what Paul, Paul is saying. Again, this isn't just to chapter 2, what he's saying. This isn't just to believers in terms of what we do individually. This is how we are to operate together. And so pray for and think about, and for leadership, let's think about what are some of the ways that we can, can lead our people, that we can lead those under our care, under our shepherding, for us to pray together. Or how can you as an individual invite some other people in your life to join you in prayer so that you don't get discouraged and so you spur one another on to keep going and keep praying in faith. Pray with others for the lost. Number four, as God begins to answer your prayers, write it down and celebrate. When somebody you've been praying for comes to faith in Christ, you praise God for it, you celebrate it big, and you let that fuel you anoint. If God could do it for them, God could do it for others who he's putting on your heart. And keep praying and don't lose heart. Don't give up. And number five, be ready to be part of the answer to your own prayers. As you pray for that loved one, as you pray for that difficult person in your family, as you pray for that challenging person at work, whoever it is that God puts on your heart, your heart may be, God, would you save them, but would you send somebody else because I don't want to get caught up in that mess. But what will often happen is that as you pray, God will begin to stir your heart that he wants you to be a part of the answer to that prayer. And you be ready like Paul was to say, God, here am I. Like Isaiah, here am I, send me. Paul says, it's the, for this I was sent as an apostle, as a teacher. I had to go. Why? Because this good news was too good to keep to myself. And so as you pray, be open to being an answer to that prayer. Here's, here's what I'd like to do for the remainder of our time this morning is to, to actually live out this command, this challenge. So can I invite you just right where you're seated, like to, if you've got a bunch of stuff in your lap or you need to set some things aside so that you can focus for a moment, can I invite you just to, to do that and I want to invite every person in this room, every believer in this room, to take a moment and thank God for saving you. Thank God that someone responded, someone was praying for you, and God responded to those prayers, and God, God reached your heart and your life. When you were undeserving, when you were far from God, when you had nothing to offer to God, when you, but that God in his grace reached out to you and drew you to himself, with Christ being the mediator to bring you and God together to bridge that distance so that you could know God. Thank God for that. And as the believers in the room are praying toward that end, you might be here this morning and say, Brian, I can't say that about my life. I can't thank God for that reality because I've never made that a truth in my life. I, I recognize that Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose, but I've, I've never accepted that as truth for me. I've never surrendered my heart and my life to Jesus then maybe this morning, right where you're seated, you just pray something like this, just to say, Jesus, today, here in this moment, I thank you that you, that God, you made me for a relationship with you, to know you, to spend forever with you. I acknowledge that my sin separates me from you. I can't be good enough. I can't be spiritual enough. I can't go to church enough. I can't, I can't be moral enough to make myself right with you. And God, you knew that. And so Jesus, God the Son, you came into the world and lived a sinless life. And on the cross, you paid the price. You gave of yourself voluntarily to die in my place to free me from the power and enslavement to sin so that I, God, could know you and have a relationship with you. And so Jesus, here, now, in this moment, I surrender to you. Come and live this life through me. I turn from my sin and I yield myself to you to your will, to your purpose, to your commands for my heart. Come live this life through me for your glory. If you prayed that way, then after the service is over, I'm going to be seating right, seated right down here on the front stage. I would love to pray with you or, or just share it with somebody who invited you today. But let someone know that they could pray and celebrate with you what God is doing in your heart. But for believers,